Hello. I am Teresa Ward, Group Managing Editor for Downstream and Midstream with Heart Energy. I'd like to welcome you to Heart Energy's webcast titled Processing Opportunity Crudes, Be Prepared for Unexpected Challenges. This webinar will explore a new strategy from Emerson Process Management for detecting fouling and heat exchangers. Today's webinar speakers are Gary Hawkins, Senior Refining Consultant, Emerson Process Management, and Ashley Hurley, Account Manager, Vincent Process Controls. Before we get started, I'd like to say a few words about the format. This webcast will consist of a single presentation followed by questions from the audience. To ask a question via the webcast, go to the chat pod located in the lower left corner of your computer screen. Type your question in the text box, then click on the Send Message button. You can submit your questions at any time during the webinar, and we'll address them at the end. Also, you can download the presentation slides by going to the handout section located under the conference materials tab at the left corner of your computer screen. The archived presentation will be available for a year on demand at the same link. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. Gary Hawkins has been with Emerson Process Management since 2007 as a refining industry consultant within the Plant Web Global Refining Industry Solutions Group. Gary has various roles to support Emerson's global refining pursuits from both technical and business perspectives. Before Emerson, Gary's, Gary was with a process licensor as a process control specialist for 31 years, including field startup work, process engineering, and technical services. During his career, Gary acquired a sound understanding of the instrumentation and process control requirements of most refining and petrochemical processes. Gary is active within the API Refining and Equipment Standards Committee. Gary has a BS in Chemical Engineering from the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Ashley Hurley came to Vincent Process Controls in January 2006 after graduating from Texas A&M University with a Bachelor's of Science degree in Chemical Engineering. She started as an Applications Engineer working with customers in the Oklahoma and North Texas region. After three years working with the Inside Sales Group, she transitioned to an account manager for the North Texas area. She most recently became North Texas team lead for the refinery and midstream gas asset groups. Now I'll turn it over to Gary. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, this is Gary Hawkins, and uh, we're going to talk about uh, one of the unexpected challenges uh, with processing opportunity crudes, and that is uh, an unpredictable following in uh, the heat exchangers and the uh, crude preheat train. So thanks, everybody, uh, for attending. And um, briefly, we'll break this uh, discussion, <coughs> excuse me, break this discussion up into uh, identifying problems with the heat exchangers and crude units, what causes the fouling, uh, how can we detect fouling, and what we consider to be monitoring best practices. So uh, with respect to identifying problems with heat exchangers, I, let me kick off with uh, uh, just some statistics here that uh, describe the uh, you know, the financial impact on the industry as a whole, uh, just to kind of uh, put the problem in perspective. It, within a uh, crude unit, let's say a 200,000 barrel a day crude unit, um, you can, you can uh, the, the increase in fouling uh, basically results in more fuel burned in the heater, and that can increase the fuel bill to a refiner, uh, you know, one and, almost one and a half million dollars, 1.4. And, uh, in, if you look at uh, the statistics in another way, um, you, the cost of fouling in the industrialized countries is equal to a quarter of a percent of their uh, gross national product. Now, um, and if the fouling gets severe to cause a shutdown in operations to, uh, to clean the uh, heat exchangers, uh, another statistic to keep in mind that a one day of lost production can be worth uh, between uh, 400000 and uh, $2 million. So this is a little financial uh, impact statements. And uh, if you're uh, listening to this, uh, perhaps you've already uh, encountered some uh, unpredictable following and would like to learn more about that. So, you know, following isn't just one person's uh, a problem. It, it really affects, uh, you know, the operations uh, in, in several different ways, um, the people responsible for the unit, the process engineers, can't really predict when, when uh, the exchanger should be cleaned and really which ones to pull. 
and that's part of the turnaround project manager's issue as well, which ones to pull. And uh, you know, it, it, it's uh, they get they're taking more data manually. Uh, they don't really have online uh, indication of the condition and ultimately impacting the operation supervisor if you can't meet the uh, production targets. So a little, little more, here's our uh, cutaway view of uh, the following inside the heat exchangers. And um, hopefully what, the, the, uh, what we'll learn here is that uh, blending of incompatible crudes uh, can be uh, a cause of uh, unpredictable or increased rate of following and we'll learn about ways to increase the visibility to the abnormal situations to uh, the operators uh, with resulting uh, you know, safer plant, reduced environmental impact, as well as uh, being able to optimize your, your cleaning schedules. So which, um, it's all about increasing the operator awareness, right? We're, we want to detect uh, um, early enough to take action to uh, prevent further uh, following. So you're being able to detect the onset of uh, a sudden increase in following uh, will have value. And the following can be either the filterable solids. Uh, if we look at the uh, shale-derived crude, the light tight oils, the, uh, they have maybe, oh, let's say, six to ten times the amount of filterable solids that you'll find in the typical crude oil. So they are more prone uh, with the, the solid material like a follow in the cold section of your uh, heat exchangers. You know, the very, the, as the crude enters the unit, um, the light tight oils also have a, a, a lot of heavy paraffins and uh, these can also uh, accumulate and cause following as well as uh, affecting the stability of the crude oil. The uh, paraffins uh, kind of uh, affect the solubility of the asphaltines in, in the aromatic phase, and you'll have an uh, increase in uh, following due to the uh, asphaltines. And the uh, method of detecting uh, following that we're going to talk about um, uses standard reporting features. We can export the data to uh, spreadsheets, and it comes with a uh, like a, a barometer or, or uh, so to speak, of uh, following if the exchanger is healthy, uh, you know, it's a warning, uh, and when it is escalating to some critical phase. We've uh, configured uh, the software to have a, a variety of alerts, whether it's an email, a text message, or an alarm uh, within the operator's uh, realm on their control system. And uh, these uh, alerts can be based on calculated heat transfer degradation or certain process measurements. And one of the, uh, the benefits of having this um, uh, additional monitoring is that you can analyze uh, occurrences that repeat and hopefully avoid those uh, in the future by not processing uh, incompatible blends. And, um, you can perform your maintenance, gives you the information of what's happening to get perform your maintenance at the most uh, cost-effective time. The, uh, with respect to the crude exchangers, again, we can see the abnormal situations as they happen, right? You've got real-time uh, visibility to the situation, predict the optimum time to clean, and the comment on uh, be alerted to potential safety hazards if you have a, uh, uh, it, it may not be uh, that prevalent in the crude preheat train, but since the methods of detecting following that we're talking about also apply to uh, other, uh, you know, process units, um, the you may have a situation with, uh, you know, one heat exchanger service that has multiple bundles, you know, from going from hot to cold, there's metallurgical changes. So if you have increased following on your hottest of those bundles, the uh, the hot material leaving, <coughs> excuse me, will be hotter than normal or hotter than design conditions, and you could be potentially operating a downstream bundle above its design temperature. And uh, if depending on the actual instances of your design and you know the uh, design margins, um, long term operation above the the uh, design temperature can lead to uh, weakening of the material and a potential. Uh, release of the process fluid with the hazards associated with that. Okay, so um, again, the uh, monitoring the uh, uh, your the, the following as it's happening, 
uh, lets us know which exchangers need to be cleaned because often the process measurements you have may only be across uh, several uh, bundles and series. And uh, uh, as the picture here is showing, uh, you know, that your profits are becoming that scale and build up on the inside of the heat exchangers. It's uh, costing you um, money in the long term. But moving on to uh, the, the get, taking a closer look now, we finished that overview. Uh, of the uh, causes of fouling. Let's take a quick look at what uh, at heat transfer in general. Let's kind of take a step back here. Um, again, the uh, the purpose of the crude heat uh, preheat train is to bring the crude up to uh, as as hot as you can get it before it hits the uh, the fired heater, right? The, the charge heater or the uh, the crude heater uh, to bring it to the final temperature to the crude column. And so every degree that of that material that's colder entering that heater is going to require more uh, fuel to be burned in the heater, which is more uh, cost as well as increasing the uh, um, the greenhouse gas uh, releases. So uh, eventually, uh, as the fouling becomes more severe, the heater fires more, and you're going to reach some limit of the heater, whether it's a tube skin temperature or some other uh, temperature of the firebox where you could put the structural supports of the heater at risk, and you would either need to uh, reduce the throughput through the unit to ease the, uh, the duty of the heater, or uh, ultimately make a decision to uh, shut down and, and clean the exchangers. So issues that affect the heat transfer, we talk about fouling, and I'm just going to generalize it here as a buildup of solid deposits, whether those solids were the fil filterable solids or the paraffins or the uh, asphaltines, whatever builds up on the surface, the, the heat exchanger surface, uh, provides a resistance to heat transfer and uh, effectively re reduces the effective area of the exchanger, the, the, the capability of the exchanger to uh, transfer the heat. And um, eventually, uh, it can lead to, to plugging. And, and what I'm uh, referring to here is actually a hydraulic limit of the unit. Now, in my personal experience, the uh, uh, crude train may have sufficient uh, hydraulics, but if you're pushing the unit to uh, you know, as much as you can get, you could be limited with the crude pump. And if you're taking too much pressure drop across a series of exchangers, uh, you're you know, for your uh, given flow rate, the control valve will end up going wide open, and now you're at the hydraulic limit of the unit, which can also have economic consequences. So uh, that being said, um, let, let's look at, uh, I mentioned asphalt team precipitation. Um, typically, uh, refiners have experience with the, the same crudes over many years and many turnaround cycles in, in cleaning, and so they have acquired a a uh, certain uh, knowledge about how often or how long they can run before you need to shut down for uh, cleaning, whether it's three years or five years or, or whatever. And the um, it, typically the asphalt team precipitation, you know, occurs at a predictable rate. I mean, it's it, it's sort of like a fact of life that it, it happens. You know, you get into the hot section of the train, and, and you're going to get that's where you typically see the asphalt team precipitation. But what makes processing these opportunity crudes, the the light tight oils. Uh, Unique is in the blend, it upsets that uh, the solubility of the uh, the asphaltine uh, in the aromatic resin phase and causes it to uh, come out of solution. So it precipitates on the tubes and there, you know, forms a a film that uh, impedes heat transfer. And as I mentioned briefly in the introduction, that the uh, paraffins, these light tight oils, can have uh, you know straight chain uh, saturated hydrocarbon paraffins may be uh, 60 carbons long, and uh, they have a, a certain affinity to lay down on the tubes as well, and we're seeing that in the, uh, the colder section of the crude preheat train. And, and the light tight oils, although they're lightweight, you know, they look like uh, light sweet crudes, easy to process. Um, if you don't have adequate filtering uh, based on your processing your prior crudes, um, you may need to update the, uh, you know, the filter, if it's an automated filter system, the backwash uh, rate uh, to handle a, a much greater amount of solids uh, per barrel, per ton, per whatever measurement. But uh, the light tight oils do come with uh, some solids, filterable solids, but you may need to pay attention to, uh, you know, before the cooling gets into the unit. And uh, corrosion can also cause following. 
Now, uh, corrosion in the crude preheat train is generally uh, not a concern, or historically uh, not a concern, but with the light tight oils, they have significant amounts of uh, H2S, hydrogen sulfide. They're sweet in the form of uh, mercaptan sulfur, but with the, uh, they do have uh, H2S dissolved, which can off-gas during the transportation, like uh, what we see in the news, the uh, rail cars. Well, we don't see the H2S, we do see the uh, rail cars, and unfortunately there was an incident just yesterday with the derailment and the fire. But the, uh, what, uh, at the point of shipping, uh, amines are added to the light tight oil to absorb the H2S, uh, however, these uh, are, uh, when you process it in the unit, can be uh, corrosive. So the, uh, we're seeing more amines, and so corrosion can be uh, a concern uh, where it wasn't uh, before. So uh, again, the, the, what are the differences? Uh, you know, the crude instability, certain blends, and it doesn't have to be a light tight oil with a conventional crude. You can uh, witness crude instability with two uh, conventional crudes. Uh, Perhaps a 50-50 mixture is still stable, but if you get to an 80-20 mixture, it becomes uh, unstable and leads to accelerated uh, asphaltine precipitation. So um, it, it, it for sure happens with the light tide oils, but you can also see that phenomenon with uh, ordinary uh, crudes, too, in the long blend. Um, poor desalter performance can also be a, a cause of... Uh, uh, corrosion as well, uh, besides the amines. Um, you can get your uh, your salt, your aqueous salt phase uh, that doesn't quite drain out of the uh, the crude oil that doesn't separate in the desalter vessel uh, can cause problems uh, in processing in the, uh, oh, I, uh, primarily uh, downstream in the crude column in the uh, upper trays and in the uh, uh, condensation section. And uh, I did mention the uh, amines <coughs> for H2S scavenging are, are uh, sources of uh, corrosion. So the, uh, there's not a lot of uh, literature out there on, uh, you know, to guide uh, refiners on what blends are incompatible and uh, may lead to unpredictable results when you process it. Uh, um, many of you out there are, are seeing this for the, uh, you know, the first time and dealing with it as it's happening. And um, so it's a, you know, another reason to pay closer attention to uh, monitoring your heat exchangers and uh, to, to avoid you know, your unplanned uh, slowdowns when your heater limited or shut down uh, for uh, uh, cleaning. And um, the, uh, let me go through this one a little quicker. We mentioned the uh, following heat exchangers is often expected and assumed to be predictable, but we're seeing uh, there are circumstances where it's not, so that's kind of a takeaway. The uh, and following results uh, in more energy consumption, or you have to reduce the uh, capacity. And uh, run operating long term above the uh, design temperature can uh, weaken equipment and uh, cause a, uh, a failure. And uh, so, all good reasons to. Uh, uh, get obtain better visibility uh, to your following. So how is how is following detected? In this uh, chart, we see on the on the left under the root cause um, asphalt paint precipitation, which we, which we talked about. Uh, it could also be a, a residual uh, material from port cleaning the last time, or you know if you're operating at lower velocities at turn down, that can uh, accelerate the, uh, the amount of uh, following and uh, the inorganic uh, salts uh, that come from the uh, salt are all lead the following and plugging causes, and then in the uh, equipment impact in the orange there uh, increases the, uh, the amount of heat you need from your process heater, from the crude heater, until you reach the capacity, uh, which you have to slow down or shut down and clean. So uh, most often the cause is uh, the asphalt heat precipitation. So this, uh, what we're showing here is the, um, the artist's conception of uh, increasing uh, following rate uh, on, the, on the chart, uh, the following factor and the amount of resistance to heat transfer. And uh, compared with uh, online, uh, gives you more of a continuous uh, view uh, to the following as it's happening versus uh, sending a person out there to acquire uh, temperatures manually that may not be uh, uh, you may not have an instrument to bring that temperature in, but perhaps there's a test well where they uh, can, can take the temperature with a handheld device and then bring that into a spreadsheet or whatever tool is used at the refinery to calculate the following. 
and this uh, procedures are usually done before a turnaround uh, uh, or if uh, the refiner is expect, uh, you know, is seeing the unexpected following. They may be taking manual measurements more often. Uh, this is can be cumbersome. Uh, it can also be a safety hazard for the uh, person taking the measurements because uh, they uh, often these exchangers are mounted uh, one on top of another, and to reach a uh, thermal well, uh, a test thermal well uh, off the ground would require a ladder or, or climbing over equipment, which can be hot too. So all good reasons uh, to uh, not um, expose your personnel to those conditions and, and just install a, a, a measurement device, a temperature transmitter. So um, does uh, monitoring help, right? Uh, you, you, once you take your data, you need to uh, analyze it to really get use out of it. And um, when you do identify the following, what, what can you do about it? And we've listed a, uh, a couple of uh, four um, examples. It, it, you, perhaps you have following mitigation techniques. Perhaps uh, chemical injection uh, might be uh, increased. Um, we've had uh, some refiners install bypass valves on the exchangers most prone to following to give them the, available, the ability to uh, clean the exchangers while the unit is operating. So you take a hit with that, you know, that you don't recover the heat from that hot process stream, but if you can take the exchanger down and clean while you're still operating, perhaps at a reduced rate, it might be that, that might be the more economical uh, operation. You, and uh, what I think would be most important is this understanding of the characteristics of blending uh, the crudes, whether two conventional crudes or a light tight oil uh, as you learn which blends uh, become uh, are, are really you shouldn't operate with because they are incompatible or uh, uh, well I guess they were unstable crude instability is another uh, term for the same uh, uh, event you know the uh, upsetting the solubility of the asphalt teams and uh, again uh, good data and information from the field uh, help let you plan uh, your cleaning and uh, avoid unnecessary uh, dismantling of an exchanger that's not really dirty. You know, you may have a, uh, a turnaround procedure where you just remove always the same exchangers uh, at uh, regular uh, at each time, and some of sometimes they uh, may not need to be uh, cleaned. So uh, here's a uh, in order to detect detect following. You need to get a handle on how much uh, heat is exchanged in the uh, the exchanger, and the duty uh, represents that as amount of heat, uh, and it's usually over a time amount of heat over time, and uh, it, the increased following results in less effective uh, to heat transfer. So as a minimum, if we look at the equation here. Um, you need the uh, mass flow rate and uh, uh, C sub P is the heat capacity in, in units compatible with the uh, the flow measurement um, and the uh, differential temperature across the exchanger. Right? So, it's a, and this is for uh, single phase fluids. And here's a sketch of how you might be operating today. I've just uh, shown the crude oil going through the bottom and the exchanging with a hot process stream, right, and that product stream where you recover that heat. And uh, they may have a, a temperature indicator on the outlet only, but no uh, temperature measurement on the, uh, the inlet. And I'm assuming they would have the crude flow. That's a fairly important flow. I would imagine uh, every refinery would have that. However, there would be a case if you had a split of uh, parallel exchangers and where the split was achieved just by using parallel piping rather than controlling the flow to each side of that parallel split, you may not have the crude flow in that one exchanger. So that could be a, a missing measurement. <coughs> Excuse me. The, uh, so in order to calculate the duty, you need the flow and the temperature on the uh, inlet and the outlet. And now to uh, calculate the following factor, we need the uh, temperatures on the other side as well of the exchanger. So um, if for, and, and graphically or uh, pictorially, what I'm showing here is that if you're missing those measurements, uh, we have a solution where we can input, uh, uh, provide wireless temperature transmitters that will bring that uh, measurements into the uh, uh, application or the control system. 
So uh, with the uh, with the four temperatures and the one flow, the flow on one side, uh, we can calculate a heat transfer coefficient, and that heat transfer coefficient can be uh, corrected for the flow rate, and its changes in the heat transfer coefficient are, are the measure of following. So when we're talking about following, we're talking about a general decrease in the uh, heat transfer coefficient. Uh, in addition to the uh, detecting fouling, we mentioned uh, hydraulic limitations might be a problem as well. And uh, we've uh, included the uh, capability to also add the differential pressure measurement, either uh, two pressure transmitters or a, a DP transmitter itself uh, from one side of the exchanger to the other uh, to allow uh, refiners or any, any user to uh, detect uh, increasing uh, pressure drop across the exchanger and use that as a, a secondary indicator of when you need to clean. I mean, maybe uh, you still have the heat transfer that you need, but you may not be able to push the flow that you need through the exchanger. So, you know, we can uh, work on a case-by-case -case basis to find the best uh, solution uh, for your situation. And uh, at this time, I, I'd like to uh, hand the uh, mic over uh, to Ashley. And uh, Ashley, if you want to take it away. All right. Thanks, Gary. Um, yes, I was involved in a project at a mid-continent refinery um, that I want to just briefly discuss today. Um, the, the refinery was having trouble getting consistent data and having a history of this data. So again, they were manually taking measurements sporadically. Um, it was difficult for the operations staff. They wouldn't consistently get the same temperature point um, every time uh, an operator would go out. So they again saw, like Gary was mentioning before, extreme fouling, and they actually had tube damage and had to replace some of the tubes. So of course, when a heat exchanger goes down, you're going to lose some production and lose money at the same time. So the solution we implemented was using um, wireless rope mount temperature and pressure transmitters um, on the cold side, the crude side, and they took these into their existing PI system. So the wireless transmitters went back to a central gateway in their crude unit, and that crude unit was then um, sent through Modbus into their PI system so that they could view it on their computers at their desk or at the operation station. So of course, this made um, the complex manager of operations and the crude processing engineer very happy. They were actually able to get data. Um, so the uh, benefits that they received from this, of course, is that they can monitor actual real-time temperatures. And these temperatures are intermediate. They're not just at the beginning and not just at the end. Um, and Hopefully, they can predict when to clean um, before design levels are reached and they are not um, over using their equipment. Again, um, they can trend the heat transfer profiles, which Gary just mentioned, so they actually have an accurate uh, heat transfer coefficient and log mean temperature difference. Those are the two points that this particular refinery was looking at to monitor when to clean um, their heat exchangers. So of course, this uh, prevents an unplanned shutdown, and they can budget the time and budget the money to clean the heat exchanger, which is definitely less cost to install an, the operations equipment and the monitoring equipment ahead of time than it is to replace a, a heat exchanger tubes and be down um, for an extended period of time. So I think, Gary, if you'll pick it back up and talk about these actual solutions. OK, thank you, Ashley. Um, so the, uh, the monitoring solutions uh, that we're talking about are uh, what we've termed uh, essential asset monitoring. And uh, we've developed modules to uh, uh, monitor uh, various types of assets, whether it's rotating equipment, on the slide in front of you, you can see in the lower left, that happens to be the, uh, the pump health monitor. So we uh, have uh, the modules developed to uh, give you this condition monitoring for pumps, blowers, uh, air-cooled exchangers, which is sort of a, considered as a combination of a uh, 
rotating equipment, being the fan as well as a, a heat exchanger, and also cooling towers. And cooling towers are a combination of the fan, the uh, the water chemistry, uh, and as as well as uh, the circulating pump. So it's kind of like three uh, modules in one. And we uh, uh, often the measurements that you need are not there, and uh, depending on the application, I've just listed uh, you know, temperature, pressure, level, and flow is pretty familiar to uh, everyone as our analytical, whether it's a pH or some water quality analyzer. Uh, but we also have uh, vibration transmitters that can be installed on uh, basically any piece of equipment, whether it's a pump, a blower, or a, a, a fan in an air cool exchanger as well as a, a wireless acoustic transmitter, which is useful for listening to uh, uh, the condition of uh, relief valves, pressure relief valves, as well as uh, steam traps. So again, rather than um, get overwhelmed with data, these uh, software modules were developed to take all these additional measurements and condense it into actionable information in, uh, in, with respect to uh, a health, a health uh, a number or a, a say a, a range of help, sort of like your uh, video game help. So um, why now? Um, well, things things are changed. If, you know, I've been in the industry for quite a while uh, on the process design side too, and you know, I often uh, I would venture to say that everybody in the audience uh, that their their process units were designed and built with the minimum amount of instrumentation. Right? Only that which you needed to safely operate the unit in the here and now. And uh, information necessary to monitor uh, assets like uh, pumps or pump health over the long term were uh, either deemed non-essential to the initial startup or uh, perhaps manual methods were used or some uh, sometimes the wired uh, methods were used to analyze rotating equipment. But generally the wired methods were reserved for the most expensive of uh, the equipment like your large recycled gas compressors, FCC blowers, things like that. So uh, now we're bringing you know, the value of that condition monitoring that the industry is uh, used to seeing over on the most expensive equipment is now you know, trickled down to uh, the available on uh, basically any of your rotating equipment. And it doesn't have to be a uh, you know expensive pump. It can be a very inexpensive pump, but high economic consequences when it fails. And it could also have safety implications if it fails, like if the seal failures are blowing out LPG. So there's uh, um, the tools available today to monitor uh, other assets besides uh, the heat exchangers as well. So uh, Smart wireless is uh, a key uh, enabler. Uh, it eliminates uh, the wiring cost once you have your your infrastructure in your place, your gateways, and that's the uh, that device in the circle on the, the bottom center of the screen. And uh, the, all the wireless devices communicate with uh, your gateways. And uh, um, the comment there about long life battery, I just want to make a, a quick comment on that. We generally target, uh, let's say, a five year battery life depending on uh, ambient conditions and the uh, frequency of updating of the transmitter. I was involved with a uh, contract from overseas that was trying to develop a specification for um, the uh, wireless. And they said uh, something like, well, every transmitter has to update every four seconds. And I said, well, that's going to kill battery life. So the uh, uh, we looked at the different types of transmitters because some consume more power than others. Like the wireless vibration transmitter, when it wakes up, it makes 32,000 measurements, and, uh, so it consumes more power. So to get a five-year battery life on that, maybe it's uh, a couple hours, two hours, let's say, between updates, versus uh, you know maybe every 10 seconds for a different type of transmitter, like pressure or temperature. And uh, if you can hear my dog barking in the background, I apologize for that. That's the uh, that's that's live media for you. Let me uh, let me see if I can. I'll I'll better now. We can edit that out of the recorded version, I'm sure. But uh, we'll move on. Um, I guess that didn't work. Uh, so again, you know, we have lots of information, and uh, again, converting the I mean, lots of data and converting that to information uh, is key, and that helps the uh, the software uh, applications. And what we're you know, many uh, facilities may already have uh, their own uh, methods of dealing with uh, uh, condition monitoring, perhaps resorting to, uh, you know, Excel spreadsheets that they've developed. And 
there may not be consistency of methodology between uh, one site to another, so we do offer you know a more of a standardized uh, methodology to uh, analyze the uh, data. I think that's a good feature. And uh, the application interfaces to uh, uh, any existing control system uh, or plant historian uh, using OPC communication. So that's uh, basically how uh, if the process measurements already exist, they can be acquired from the plant historian. And if the process measurements don't exist, we can bring that in uh, through the new measurements through the wireless gateway. Um, the uh, it, not only that, the uh, the information can be made visible to who needs it, right? With multiple departments. Um, we don't need to uh, bother the operators with all the behind the scenes monitoring of this equipment. Um, you know, we're we're thinking that the uh, maintenance and reliability personnel are the people that would be paying mo the most attention to the detailed screens, uh, and then contact operations when uh, they think maintenance is required. So. Um, at the bottom of the screen here, you can see the uh, um, kind of a fuzzy graphic of the uh, the heat exchanger screen. So let me move to the next slide, and that's uh, a little clearer picture. Um, over in the upper left-hand corner, that's where the most important uh, summary of the information is. And this, the health is down to 25%. And uh, there's an alert that says heat exchanger following is detected. So the uh, around the graphic, uh, I know it, uh, everyone's heat exchanger doesn't quite look like that, but we, this is kind of a one-size-fits-all picture. But the, uh, the process parameters that are uh, measured are, are shown on the screen, and, and this one has uh, you know, everything, right? The, the delta P on each side, it's got the flow on each side, and it's got the inlet and outlet temperatures on each side. That would be uh, not required for everything. Like I said, to get following, we need one flow and four temperatures. And if your particular installation didn't have all these measurements, those would be suppressed and you know they wouldn't show up on the screen. On the right hand side, we see the uh, uh, calculated values. Uh, the top two are the hot side and cold side duties, and uh, basically uh, they, those should be equal, right? If everything's perfect, but you know flow measurements can have an error. Um, temperature measurements are generally pretty accurate, but maybe there's an error caused by the uh, installation or something. So. We, if the information is available, we will calculate the duty on both sides and compare it. And uh, you corrected, uh, you observed is the heat transfer uh, coefficient as calculated, and the fourth one down there is corrected, uh, corrected for flow. Because if, the, if you're just calculating a heat transfer coefficient based on a static set of conditions and the flow changes, you're not necessarily going to get the same heat transfer coefficient observed. So you do need to uh, normalize that, so to speak, with the, uh, the flow. And the following factor is a uh, when the uh, heat transfer coefficient deviates from uh, a, a preset value or a baseline value by uh, a preset amount, and you can adjust that, and then you'll get a uh, an alert. So um, the uh, we were looking at the overview screen. If we click on a detailed screen. Uh, you can see the actual process measurements, and apologies, that looks a little uh, fuzzy. But in the graph, uh, in the trend, uh, you can see the uh, the red line there is the temperature uh, um, is is increasing. Uh, in other words, uh, the delta T across the uh, if it's hot in and becoming hotter out, the differential temperature is going down, and the duty is decreasing. So uh, you can actually see the trends, or you can track. Um, the actual calculated variables. The software allows you to pick any of the variables on the left side and uh, trend um, up to up to six at a time, and you can adjust the, uh, the time scales as well. And you can also export this information to uh, uh, like uh, an Excel spreadsheet, for example. So uh, the features of an essential asset monitoring, uh, um, the again the uh, uh, we need the inlet and outlet temperatures on uh, one side and the flow to calculate the duty, right? And so if you get the temperatures on the other side, and again, it's assuming single phase on, on each side, uh, then you can calculate the uh, following factor. And uh, the software again informs uh, when the changer is excessively followed. 
Um, multiple sets of engineering units are also uh, pre-configured, and uh, we address many languages. Uh, if there's a language we haven't done, uh, we can create a table. A table can be created uh, to be, uh, you know, if you're using Klingon or something. The uh, uh, the basic inputs available are, are listed there below. Uh, you know, the, the hot and cold side flow, hot and cold side inlet and outlet temperatures, and the hot and cold side differential pressure. That would be the um, all of the variables that we would think you would possibly need. Again, you don't need them all all the time, but those are available. And we calculate hot side duty. If you have that information, cold side duty. Look at the, uh, the difference. Uh, calculate an average heater duty over uh, periods of time, and uh, also the, uh, the heat transfer coefficient, again, observed and corrected for flow, and from that we get the following factor. And now there's a, a economic calculation, too, with the, the cost of fuel gas, and as the calculated duty uh, decreases, that has to be made up for in the heater, not just equal amounts, but uh, a margin above that because the heater's not 100 percent efficient either, right? So if you lose a BTU in the exchanger, you've got to make it up with like one and a quarter BTUs in the heater, and uh, calculate the cost of the uh, you know the degradation in the uh, heat transfer. In other words, the, the increase of fouling it does have this uh, uh, a cost trend, and uh, it's all uh, basically based on a baseline capture when uh, the software is commissioned. Um, it may not be a clean exchanger at that time, depending on when we start, but uh, you can really acquire a baseline at any time, and then after an exchanger cleaning, you can put laid out a new baseline and track the performance from there. So here's a, um, kind of an overview of the, the components that make up the system. At the top, we have the, uh, the view uh, to the acid in question. Again, whether it's a heat exchanger or a pump, or a compressor, blower, cooling tower. And uh, if you're missing measurements in order to, uh, uh, which I would bet that many people are don't, uh, because the plants weren't built with all the measurements you need, the, uh, the combination of the, the gateway to bring the information in and then the field devices, whether it's a temperature transmitter uh, in the upper left, that's, that uh, can accept up to four uh, temperature elements and broadcast them as, as one uh, transmitter. Uh, we also have single uh, temperature transmitters available and the uh, DP transmitter. And then uh, flow um, usually exists, but like I mentioned before, there's uh, if you have parallel split, uh, often that's done with parallel piping that controls, so you might be missing a flow. And there, there are methods of uh, inserting um, uh, an orifice plate in between two piping flanges. In other words, they don't have to be orifice flanges, but uh, Rosemount has available a, a, a compact uh, flow meter where you can just stick it between a couple uh, set of flanges. And then that orifice plate in the lower left, that's a, a, a relatively recent development, uh, recent in my terms, so within the last uh, 10 years probably. <laughs> the, uh, um, it doesn't need the upstream and downstream pipe diameters. That's what's key about that, right? It's plus or minus two to get the same accuracy as a single bore orifice plate. Um, and if the process measurement is difficult to take, uh, let, let's, let's back up from the crude uh, example and just look at a, uh, a product rundown cooler. If you have cooling water on the other side, that flow of that is seldom me uh, measured. But with the uh, compact flow meter, you can put it in on the cooling water, add the temperatures. Now you can get the duty uh, calculated on the cold side if for some reason the hot side was difficult. Could be a condenser, could be two phase or something. OK, so with uh, um, that. Uh, I think we're uh, ready for questions. Uh, I'd like to, uh, if you go to the Emerson website, it's kind of hard to uh, memorize there, but I believe that link is still uh, active on the uh, PDF version that you can download of this uh, presentation. And uh, better yet, uh, since you know, in the time allowed, we're kind of running through the whole story here. If you'd like to see a, uh, a live demo of the software, please contact my colleague, Jason Sprayberry. And his email is uh, listed there on that page. So, um, uh, Teresa, I think I'm uh, ready to take a break here and uh, have a sip of coffee and uh, wait for my first question. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. That concludes the formal presentation. Now we'll have, a few, we'll have time for a few questions. We've received quite a few, and we'll get through as many as possible. The first one, Gary, what are the methods for predicting the asphaltine precipitation rate? It's uh, basically based on the uh, the past, 
right? It, it, we're looking at we're looking in the rearview mirror here. We're getting uh, data on the condition of the uh, uh, the exchanger, and you can either if you don't change your operating conditions, you can probably extrapolate where you are. Uh, but when you see, when you detect a, a unexpected increase in the precipitation rate, you need to take action um, that that we're not controlling. We're just providing visibility here. So either uh, you know if you have a facility to to check chemicals to mitigate the uh, the precipitation, that's a possibility, or uh, change the crude blend. Is, is there a, another question? Yes. Thanks for that. And again, to ask a question, go to the chat pod located in the lower left corner of your computer screen. The second question, how to correct the heat transfer coefficient for flow? Um, there are um, in industry standard uh, calculations uh, for uh, um, non, uh, for, for two phase, uh, or for, I'm sorry, for single phase conditions, we use the uh, Ditas Bolter uh, correlation. And um, there are some coefficients that can be set. Uh, it's it's uh, customized. Uh, coefficients are selected to give you the uh, heat transfer coefficient that um, independent of flow. Um, it's really you know uh, that that's it in a nutshell. Uh, okay, all right, and we have another question. Is the temp and pressure transmitter only one unit? No, uh, the temperature and pressure transmitters are separate devices. Okay. Uh, next question: How does calculated LMTD affect the calculated heat transfer coefficient and resultant fouling? How does the calculated LMTD? Affect the heat transfer coefficient and uh, calculate heat transfer coefficient and fouling. Mm -hmm. um, the I mean other uh, it's used in the equation uh, to calculate a heat transfer coefficient, and then that is used to uh, it's corrected for flow, and then changes in the corrected heat transfer coefficient is an indication of fouling. This is the way we have it set up. Okay. Okay. I am going to the next question. Just stand by a second. Yes. Are there surface mounted thermocouples not requiring thermo well? Um, I think the uh, when the unit is built, uh, the uh, customer or contractor has the option of selecting uh, uh, test thermal wells, and I, that would be the ideal situation if you're taking the temperatures uh, manually. You know, it's a plugged thermal well. They just unscrew the cap and insert the uh, the element and get the reading. We can replace that with a temperature element in that well uh, with a transmitter. Now, uh, if the cost was saved and those test thermal wells were not uh, added, there is a uh, we do have a pipe clamp sensor. That clamps around the pipe and and spring loads the temperature element to the skin of the pipe, and then uh, if you could insulate over that, uh, is a method to get a temperature. Um, it, it's uh, you know it certainly has uh, more error than what you could do with the thermal well, but it might be uh, sufficient to to uh, get you to the next turnaround uh, to uh, consider you know adding a nozzle. Uh, and a thermal well to that application, but it's not a showstopper. If you don't have a thermal well, there are, there are things we can do. We just have to. You're going to lose uh, some accuracy, but perhaps uh, you know it's repeatable uh, with the pipe clamp sensor because you're sensing basically the outside temperature of the uh, the pipe. So I would, um, but, you know, the uh, the time lags between changes in temperature are probably. Not that significant because we're really looking at uh, you know longer term uh, phenomenon. You know, it's not uh, once a second type process control. So there is the uh, the pipe clamp sensor is available from uh, Rosemount. Okay, we have another question. It appears the fracking fluids and waxes found in the shale oil are speeding up the fouling of the front end refinery units. Can you please discuss that? Um, well, I agree with that. Uh, and um, you know there are uh, other 
uh, companies involved in providing services to the industry as well with uh, you know chemical uh, treatment methods and things like that uh, to help uh, avoid that. But that's certainly uh, one of the uh, unexpected challenges of dealing with the uh, the light tight oils is that they uh, they you know especially with those solids and uh, the paraffins are uh, refiners are experiencing following where it wasn't really traditionally seen. So I, I agree with that observation. Okay, next question. Um, have the first group of refineries that initially started processing shale crude, such as Valero Three Rivers, been the ones to blaze the trail on asset monitoring technology? Any trends related to that you could discuss? Um, I, I would say that uh, I, I, you're... Uh, I would have to decline talking about any particular uh, customer and what their plans were or have been, but uh, we would say the, uh, in general, the refiners that have first got into the processing the light tight oils are the first ones to uh, see the problems. Okay. Uh, another question. Is the user, user interface limited to being within the refinery co control system, or is this a web-enabled application that can be viewed externally? Uh, there are a number. Of, the, uh, the answer is yes. There's a number of ways to uh, implement the uh, the solution, either as on a PC or application station running, you know, on the control network, or uh, it can be uh, used, uh, outside uh, the firewall, for example, in, in the business network. Of, as long as you can pass the data, uh, there's a, a way to do it. And we have multiple seats available too. It's not just one screen. You can have uh, multi-seat licenses for the software as well. Okay. Uh, one other question we have here. Um, are the sensors wireless to the transmitters? Um, with respect to uh, a pressure transmitter, you know, it's the it's conventional uh, transmitter hooked up to the process, but instead of wires to the control system, it is uh, um, you know, broadcast wirelessly to the gateway. Uh, with the temperature transmitters, the sensor, the thermocouple element, or the RTD, whatever is uh, selected, is uh, wired to the transmitter itself. And uh, just a footnote, I did show the picture of the four, um, the temperature transmitter model that can take up to four uh, elements. Um, some customers have felt that it's it's easier to use a single, you know, one-to-one -one relationship and mount the transmitter actually on the uh, the thermocouple head. Uh, that's also a possibility. But uh, between the sensor itself that's in the thermal well, the temperature sensor is wired to the transmitter just like it would be with a conventional temp uh, temperature transmitter, except that instead of the 4 to 20 milliamp wiring to take it into the control system, it's wireless from the, the transmitter to the gateway and then into... Uh, the control system or wherever that data is directed to go. Um, what are the temperature and pressure ratings of the transmitters and sensors? Well, the uh, temperature sensor is uh, installed in process uh, in, in a thermal well. So basically any thermal well uh, that's suitable for the process can be used, just like uh, no, no different from wired to wireless for temperature, right? And uh, it's just you know from the transmitter of the control system that's wireless, so that that's the same. And the uh, pressure transmitter is available from Rosemount in um, exactly the same as the uh, the wired versions. So uh, quite extensive range of uh, pressures, and inc encourage you to talk to uh, you know your Rosemount salesperson to understand more of the details of your particular situation. Uh, generally, the crude train. You know, I'm thinking that the crude pump discharge might be 700 psi at the highest, but uh, you know, if your particular exchanger is in a different type of uh, process unit that may have significantly higher pressures, um, the Rosemont has a different pressure temp uh, sorry pressure transmitter or a differential pressure transmitter that can meet uh, your needs there. Okay, another question. Um, this is part of AMS suite. What are the elements? What are the elements required to set it up onto a Honeywell system? The uh, it would be a, an application station. It can it can stand alone um, from a Honeywell or Yokogawa or anybody else's uh, control system. It is integrated within Delta V, but the um, uh, 
we've designed the solution to be available for any refiner with any control system. Basically, uh, OPC communication is the way the uh, data is moved uh, back and forth. If you wanted to send an alert to your uh, DCS or whatever, we can do that. If uh, you know we need to get information from a historian, uh, we would use OPC to get it. So it's uh, um, you know, the the solution runs on an app station, really, in, in any environment. Okay. Another question we have here. Um, how do you justify the cost of installation since it does not reduce the fouling rates? Um, it, re it provides increased visibility. Yes, that's a, that's a good question. Um, it doesn't, uh, it, you know, if you're talking about monitoring a pump, and the pump fails and causes a shutdown or an interruption or a hazardous release or a fire or something like that, it's easier to point your fingers at a single event uh, of a, you know, more of a catastrophic failure. Uh, heat exchangers, uh, for the most part, we're talking following. I mean, if, if a shell split open, that could be a catastrophic failure. But what, you know, the most common uh, um, you know, the, the problem with operation is that the, uh, the heat transfer is just reduced and reduced and reduced until you have to take some kind of uh, action there. So the, uh, uh, it, it, I agree, it, it, it's difficult to uh, lead to a uh, calculation of the value. Uh, it's, all, it's almost more uh, emotional. You know, it, it makes, uh, if you're the process engineer, it makes your life easier to be able to see what's happening to this piece of equipment. So it's really the value of uh, you knowing that information. Um, there's value in turnaround planning. Um, and so it, it, uh, if you're actually uh, working on a project to install uh, the monitoring, we can work with you on a case-by-case -case basis to help pinpoint uh, the value and you know what the capacity of the process is. Um, there's a uh, Again, value in knowing what's happening to the pieces of equipment so you can predict uh, when you're going to be maybe approaching the thermal limit of your process heater as well as uh, increasing your uh, um, greenhouse gas emissions as well. So it's, it, it's more of a, a complicated story. And, and again, what's the value of, uh, of cleaning? Uh, uh, some um, operating companies have decided that uh, their, with their increased visibility, they were able to pinpoint the bad actors, so to speak, the, the particular exchangers. Because you may have 20 exchangers uh, in the heat, crude preheat train, and it may only be three or four that are seem to be the most uh, troublesome the most often, and they've installed bypass uh, piping so you can keep running and take the exchanger down and clean. So again, there's uh, a variety of solutions. And, and you know, I appreciate the question, and I wish it was as simple as saying, uh, here's the value. But um, I think if, if, if you, uh, you know, contact Jason, talk, get a demo, and start getting some uh, estimated costs of an installation and see and understand the benefits that brings you or the, uh, making your life, what the value is uh, to make your life easier and compare that to the, the cost of installation. But generally, um, you know, the bigger the capacity of the unit, the more energy is consumed, the more uh, following is, a, is an impact on the, uh, the operation. And even with the small refinery, too, uh, you know, margins are important, keeping, keeping ahead of the curve, so to speak, and understanding uh, when your costs are going up and giving you the information to take action. So it's, it's basically what's the value of the information. You know, we can tell you what the cost of the installation is. The value of the information is uh, maybe uh, we need to explore with you. Thanks, Gary. That well, you're welcome. That concludes the formal presentation, um, and thank you again. This will, be, this will serve as the close of the webinar, and I thank everyone again, especially our distinguished presenters and the sponsor, Emerson Process Management, and for our listeners for joining us. Um, don't forget to download the presentation slides by going to the handout section located under the conference materials tab at the left corner of your computer screen. In one week, you'll receive a thank you email that will include a link to the replay of this webinar, which will be available for one year. This concludes our webcast, and we thank you all for joining us today.